media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Danielle Park, editor of the popular blog Juggling Dynamite and president of Venable Park Investment Council Incorporated. Her website's JugglingDynamite.com and VenablePark.com. Welcome back to the show, Danielle. Hey, thanks, Jim. Danielle, how long is this uh, summer bear market going to last? I mean, mm, this rally that, that we're seeing right now. Isn't that the question? Um, the, the, well, no one actually knows the answer to that, but we don't have a lot of indicia of a bottom. Let's put it that way. What we have is a lot of behavioral things that are revived again. Uh, as of August, we see a lot of um, social media influencers again back at recommending stocks. Um, we see uh, the the rally in the so June June sixteenth was a, the kind of the low, and over the last you know six weeks we've seen uh, a rally in, but it's been led by the most speculative names. So the same ones that have been beaten off the worst, beaten up the worst. The um, you know um, some of the meme names again have. Uh, the most shorted stocks, the ones that people had bet heavily were going to fall in price, they've been buying them back again in the last week. That short covering such that you see now the structure of the the options market is really the most n- net long the speculators have been in a long time. Um, so that typically suggests that the buying pressure that comes when they step in to buy back and cover the shorts, that creates these bear market rallies. Um, and, you know, again, in past bear markets, that have lasted, you know, 18 months to two years. We've seen about six to eight of these significant bear market rallies. They tend to be uh, in the sort of 7 to 18% range. This one that we're just completing or so far is, um, you know, has come up about 11% for global stocks. Like generally speaking, the whole global basket is up about 11%. Um, that, but it's still down about 15% from the, from the high. The NASDAQ's rallied about 19. So this is back, you know, this whole, uh, point I'm making about the main, main stocks and funds that have seen the inflows here have been the most sort of sketchy ones, um, that had fallen a lot in the past. So the NASDAQ's up 19% since June, but it's actually still down 21% since November. So we're still in a bear market per se. Um, and, um, TSX, again, it's been the late cycle standout here because of its heavy weight in uh, fossil fuels and banks, which are late cycle. And so it, too, has rallied about 7% since mid-July, but it's still off about 11% from the peak. Um, the S&P 500, of course, which is the most widely benchmark, uh, benchmarked or followed or replicated stock market in the world, it's rallied another 10% uh, in this same period, but it's still about negative 13 from uh, where it peaked on January the 3rd. The Russell, which is really economically sensitive because it tends to be the smaller companies that are more indic- indicative of the general economy, it's still um, off 22% from its high last October. So all these things really suggest to me, um, when you look at the macro background, which is really important because a lot of people get confused with the idea that, you know, good companies are good stocks, full stop. Well, actually, what happens to move markets is 70% macro factors. So this is the overall arching economic climate, the demographics, the debt levels, the housing market is a big major leader of the economic cycle. So the things that are happening And ultimately, the credit cycle leads the housing market, right? So it's really credit that leads the whole thing. And we're in a very much still in a central bank hike mode. You know, the Bank of England hiked a half 
5% today. That's the most it's ever done since 1987. <laughs> it's the largest hike. I mean, this really shows you we've been in this era of uh, gutless leadership in terms of central banks for such a long time, and that's why we've got this very bubblicious environment where, you know, everything has gone up far more than it ought to have, and people have really lost connection with fundamental value or what actually drives productivity or actually improves um, the future prospects, everything that we've done has been around short-termism and speculating and quick bucks and gambling, but very little to do with things that will actually help us in the long run. So, uh, again, the macro environment is very much impacted by the credit cycle, which is still in a downturn because central banks are still in the hike mode, you know, intending to go another 75 beeps for the for the uh, U.S. Fed at the next meeting. Um, and the rate of change already has been extreme, so abrupt, right? So this is why I think we've seen this collapse in consumer confidence and business expectations and home building expecta- uh, home builder sentiment. Um, it's really profound. Like the, the U of Michigan Consumer Expectation Survey, the latest one for July, came in at the lowest reading since May of 1980. Like, the, you know, the Chinese consumer confidence is the lowest since ever recorded, which started in 1994. And I'm talking a lot lower than ever recorded. Um, the share of people expecting lower prices uh, in North America over the next five years is now uh, – the highest that we've seen since 2008. So again, this whole bias around, you know, inflation is runaway and expectations that prices were only going to go up. That's really, I think, come to a hard stop here because people are realizing, for example, that housing is definitely wobbling and, and falling off the rails. Uh, in a lot of places, home sales have just collapsed. Prices are following. Um, you know, the, the share of, uh, of consumers saying that now is a good time um, to buy a home is the lowest it's been since, uh, sorry, it's been, the people who say it's a bad time to buy a home is the highest since November of 1982. Like the superlatives here just keep going. Those thinking it's a bad time to buy a car is the highest since the last recession. Um, so it's, it's really entrenched now because people are, you know, yes, gas prices have come off significantly and we saw, for example, U.S. gasoline demand is lower today than in the summer of 2020 when, if you recall, we were all in the pandemic lockdown. So even though prices have been falling for two straight months, people are not yet driving. Um, they haven't, they're not going back to, you know, spending the way they were. Um, and we're seeing that contraction in demand all over the world. So that's why commodities continue to be in a down cycle. Shipping costs have come off significantly. So all of these things really are the macro factors that dictate this entire cycle. And although, as I explained, you have technical rallies within bear markets, as we've seen, um, I think that this latest one is probably about have is probably about at the end or having run its gambit. We'll see. You know, in here, it's about back to where we thought it might peak in terms of a rebound. And so, anyway, long story short, I don't think we're through this bear market by a long shot. And I think that we should expect. Um, a rollover to another lower low and probably two or three more of those before we ever even get through um, to this. We haven't even had the, the declaration, official declaration of a recession. And although, you know, the best indicators suggest it may have already started, you don't typically get that declaration till six months or so after it's already started in retrospect. Um, and you don't typically get a bottom in the stock market until you know, the very near the very end of the recession, like the last few months of the recession when central banks have already been cutting rates for a significant period of time and are almost done their cutting uh, action. So if you think about it today, we're exactly the opposite of that condition, right? We're still with no recession yet declared and with central banks still in a hiking mode. Now, some in the U.S. have argued that uh, even though they've had two quarters of negative growth, which technically is a recession, they say it's not a recession because there are still over 10 million job openings in the U.S. My question is, is this really a matter of demographics or economics? Yeah, well, the job openings is not the best indicator, right? We're starting to see the layoffs tick up, um, the hours worked being cut. Um, so those are the more um, leading indicators of the employment cycle. It takes some time for people to actually move on to unemployment claims, that sort of thing. But we're seeing the leading edge. For example, tech was the leading edge of the sector in housing. 
um, in this latest, uh, you know, expansion cycle. And we've certainly seen both of those sectors are now rolling over hard and starting to have layoffs and cutbacks. So I think that is the leading edge of this wedge. And, you know, the, the, the thing that I'm quite concerned about here is that the household, in particular in Canada, is going into this. So we're already having a tick up in defaults. You know, the auto loan sector is really, they're seeing a lot of defaults now in the auto loan sector, just with the rise in rates, never mind any rise in unemployment, right? So the real fragility here is that we have these extremely over-levered households who have been reaching for unaffordable homes for some time at very low rates. Now we've had the backup in rates and also the spike in the cost of food and energy. That spike in food and energy has typically been the trigger for recessions historically, repeatedly through time. We have that this time on top of uh, the most indebted households that we've seen in decades. And so that just means that, um, you know, even before you get this jump in unemployment in terms of the averages, that which is a more lagging indicator, you've got households struggling. And as I say, consumer sentiment at these extraordinary lows. And this is still with, as I say, unemployment near you know record lows. So just start to see a, a, a marginal increase in that. And it doesn't take a lot of increase in the unemployment rate, right? Just a small amount of... of uh, Increase in unemployment typically is is a, a very negative impact in terms of the multiplier for the overall economy because just that the demand cycle is already peaked and rolled over. People already pulling back. They've gone into their credit cards. They've gone into debt, uh, their lines of credit to the extent they're able to just try and cover the bases. But now as this you know, weight of this downturn picks up speed and we have the negative impacts sort of accelerating, people are just not able to continue doing that, right? There's a limit to how much they can actually service, and we're seeing that now. So they're looking at ways to cut back even before they lose their job. We'll have more with Danielle Park right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com Weekly Recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com Weekly Recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Danielle Park. Danielle, if uh, Zuckerberg had his way, we'd all live in the metaverse. But uh, even uh, meta verse uh, real estate is taking it on the chin now i remember not long ago people were paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy imaginary real estate on an imaginary island <laughs> right so it, th- <laughs> that really just says it all doesn't it jim that really encapsulates the madness that was um and you know you knew at the time it was crazy because so many people were buying so much that made no actual sense. Again, back to zero productivity enhancement, zero reduction of your costs over the longer run, right? They're doing things that made no sense uh, financially or economically, and many of them were borrowing to do it. There's the real kicker. <laughs> you know, we're talking about uh, not just in the real real estate space where a lot of people were buying uh, cars and uh, sorry, homes and autos, condos were highly, uh, you know, scooped up by so-called investor class who are highly levered, um, with very minimal down, you know, they take, the, they take the funds from lines of credit or other places, but to basically make these bets. And now you've got them balking because prices are rolling over and they are now saying, well, I'm not, you know, they don't want to sell it for that. So this is all typical. This is why the housing uh, downturns typically take some time because the first reaction is to, well, I'm not, you know, my neighbor got X dollars more two months ago and I'm not going to take this, so I'm just going to wait it out. There's a certain amount of that. Then there's a whole bunch of people who are capitulating and putting back, looking to rent these properties, right? Because I was pointing out last year that many of them were buying these properties with um, negative carry, even with extraordinarily low interest rates. So now that interest rates have essentially tripled on mortgages, again, that takes some time to filter through the economy. And that's why we say that the Fed policy changes typically hit the economy at a lag of several quarters. And the reason for that is, although mortgage rates initially 
uh, spike on the expectation of incoming rate cuts, uh, sorry, rate hikes from the central banks. What it is is the bond marks, markets repriced, so you get that impact quickly on mortgage rates, but not everyone's mortgage is up for renewal right away, right? So it takes some time for these terms to come in, and then, you know, aren't I've our neighboring property at our office, the owner recently listed the property and he told me the reason he was selling it was because his commercial mortgage was coming up for renewal this summer and the rate was going to be significantly higher than he'd had for the past few years. So there, you know, that there's a definite urgency now for people to sell these properties that weren't making sense financially before because they'd only bought them on the expectation that it would be, a, you know, that the increase in price would outrun any deficit in operations. So you've got all that going on now and that the um, amount of listings coming on the market for rent in places like the greater Toronto area where I live is just extraordinary. Um, and wherever there isn't rent controls, people are also looking to hike their, their rent rates uh, to try and cover the excess cost. So all that's going on. And then uh, under the surface, you have, as, as, I, as you alluded to, this meltdown in the virtual real estate prices, which is really mirroring this uh, ongoing thing in the real world. And it's, uh, you know, again, a function of contagion, right? Why has cryptocurrencies all collapsed, come off so significantly from the high? They were perfectly correlated with all this stuff, right? There was no diversity benefit in these various assets, so-called asset types, because they were all part and parcel of this speculative frenzy, which was driven by credit, which was at, you know, because credit was easy and cheap, uh, people lost their minds. And this time they lost their minds with like uh, to an extreme degree that we really haven't seen. It's really like, especially as I say in Canada and other some other places like China, there was this combination of a housing boom bu- uh, bubble like we saw in the U.S. market in the peak of 2006-7, and you couple that with this technology bubble like we saw in the peak of 2000, and we've really now got these best of <laughs> these worst <laughs> best of worst worlds mm-hmm. combined at this time. So everything's been infiltrated by the urgency to get back capital to raise liquidity margin calls are contagious of course because you get them when asset prices drop and you're levered and you have to look to sell to raise cash so you're you're seeing all that going on under the surface at the same time this is an international phenomenon right like i've mentioned many times how the u.s dollar is the funding currency of the world and that a lot of emerging markets when the u.s dollar is uh falling um, will actually, when U.S. rates were very low, they would actually borrow money, take out debts based in U.S. dollars so that they could access these lower rates. Um, and now what's happened, of course, in the last year as the U.S. dollar has uh, really exploded higher, again, to the high, you know, back to the superlatives, the highest in 20 years, um, what you see is that there's this big crunch going on for cash because it's so much more expensive for them to service debts in these emerging economies. And you've got places like, you know, India, China, Thailand, Korea, they're all spending billions right now to try and prop up their currencies so that they can contain the, you know, so they don't lose this um, this purchasing power to such an extreme against the U.S. dollar because that also, you know, increases their trade deficits and their debt costs and it increases the inflation for anything they have to import into their own country. You've got places like Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Bangladesh. They've already gone to the IMF for solvency support. And we're only, you know, like we're, we're literally only a few months into this downturn. So I think what you're, what you're going to see is this uh, ebb and flow continue for potentially months to come here. Um, and that's why I think that the animal spirits of the investor class, the speculative class, the retail class, will ultimately get crushed into submission. Um, they're, they've been deeply wounded. Um, you see all sorts of horrifying things, like people saying they're basically, you know, uh, have lost their life savings in some of these crazy crypto, you know, whether they're the currencies themselves or the companies or, you know, the service platforms. They've lost a, they've lost a fortune. And uh, they're, they're now trying to gamble it back again, which is really incredible. But in the end, they will finally stop that give up and um, cut their losses or try and, you know, go bankrupt or do whatever it is they need to do to tab the rest. 
Now, I know we've talked about it before, but I keep seeing the ads all the time saying, hey, get our free trading app. What's a better way to make money than for free? Are those free, so-called free trading apps really free? No, they're not. They're a scam. They're sketchy. They're, they're predatory. Uh, it's just been such an extremely difficult uh, time to observe the uh, the extreme uh, evil that's gone on really in suckering people in and and you know stripping them of any funds that they may have now there's a there's a certain responsibility here because there's a lot of gullible greedy people out there who are ready to double or nothing and gamble out of desperation or sometimes just out of pure greed because they think that they can get rich quick and they do all these things and they're very susceptible to the gamification side of the trading um, platforms and you know Robin Hood is the classic even the name is just an oxymoron for what they were actually about right which was this you know sucker people in on the idea that trading is free well nothing is free and trading trading you know responsible transparent um uh fair trading is anything but free there's a bunch of uh, parties working there there's you know components that have to be matched um but the the um the product line that's been rolled out as uh, in the last few years has been how do we entice people in with the notion that it's free? Let's not charge them a transparent fee that they can see, but we'll take it off the back end, right? So I, I've been saying all along, it's much better to have a transparent fee up front where people can make rational decisions about whether it's worth their, it's in their interest to buy or sell something based on the commission involved or the cost involved. Without that information, they're really, you know, uh, flying blind, and in doing so, they are scalped by all sorts of nefarious forces who are, you know, selling the order flow. Um, you know, it's the it's the the for profit model that has become the norm of the exchanges. And you know, I've almost um, given up all hope that we're going to see any serious crackdown or regula- regulation or return to more sober rules that we had in place for you know 70 years. So it's not true that we can't have responsible, and it doesn't have to be extremely complicated regulation. It just needs to be pretty simple that you can't do this at all, and you must do that. You know, you must be transparent. You um, you can't uh, sell flow. You know, that's a breach of your duty to your consumer and your your customer, all that sort of thing. So anyway, there's there's a lot more. Um, I mean, there's more. I think discussion or um, people writing and talking about the abuses that have run rampant this cycle. But I think until people are, like I say, until the system is really cracked and on its <laughs> on its bottom, when prices have come off so hard that, you know, the speculative crowd is wiped out, uh, that the retail investor has lost their shirt, that pensions are once more in huge deficits, which has been happening year to date, Um, then there's going to be outrage and anger, and that's typically when after the horse has left the barn, you'll see them come in and start trying to uh, regulate this space. It'll be be too late, but it must happen all the same. How do these so-called free apps make money if they don't charge you a brokerage fee? They, um, so they work with these other intermediaries, so they, you know, they're basically their computer, their high, their trading system sees your order coming, and within a nanosecond sells that information to another intervening party, who then sells, uh, makes a trade in advance of your trade so that they can take a spread. And it, it, it's a tiny spread, but if they do it on, uh, you know, millions of orders, uh, every week, it really adds up. So this is the citadels of the world where people, you know, the, the founders have become some of the wealthiest people in the world over the last 10 years. Um, again, it's, it's highway robbery. It should be illegal, um, but they've got away with it. Um, a lot of it is because it was, you know, enabled by new technology that came out by the speed of computers that was ramped up so significantly in the last 20 years. Uh, since 2008, it's really um, gone gangbusters. Um, but then, you know, a bunch of these uh, these companies that were doing this, so again, marketing themselves as helping the little guy, in fact, doing the exact opposite, uh, selling the flow to these uh, larger parties, larger sharks who were manipulating, front-running, 
Thanksgiving, all these things have been illegal for, you know, decades and decades in the, in, in the normal regulation, but they've come out with different ways of doing it, which the legislation didn't catch up with. And plus, you know, the lawmakers and the regulatory forces are this revolving door in and out of Wall Street, and so there's no will or actual serious effort to curtail it. But anyway, the point is that it's just been, again, part and parcel of this financialization obsession, this wasted uh, capital, this mis- misallocated capital, um, you know, which again pr- does the opposite of improving productivity, or it does it, it increases costs rather than reduces costs uh, under the hood. So that's the that's why we're going to pay a heavy price here because we've been doing it uh, so backwards for so long. Danielle, thank you so much for chatting with us. Hey, thank you. My guest has been Danielle Park, editor of the popular blog Juggling Dynamite and president of Venable Park Investment Council Incorporated. Her website's jugglingdynamite.com and venablepark.com. If you have any questions for Danielle or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at How Street. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.